and welcome back to Neo Psychology of me, your teacher, Mr. Neo, the channel where I teach online psychology lessons for my wonderful students. Today we're carrying on with this, the unit of social influence and we're looking at lesson nine, minority influence. Let's get started. Starter. Can you think of any famous people throughout history who have started with ideas that were considered ridiculous, dangerous or rebellious, but were eventually accepted? Why were these people's ideas eventually accepted? That's what we're going to look at today by minority influence. We've said quite a lot so far about how majorities apply pressure to others in their group. But if this is the only pressure that is felt, how does change come about? Where do new ideas come from? Serge Moscovici was the first to identify the process of minority influence as a contrast to majority influence. He introduced the idea of minority influence to explain innovation, new ways of doing things. So. We're going to have a look at uh, a couple of concepts today. Minority influence. We're going to look at Moscovici et al's 1969 research, and then we're going to discuss and evaluate minority influence. Let's get started. Minority influence refers to how one person or small group influences the beliefs and behaviors of other people. The minority may influence just one person or a group of people, the majority. This is different from conformity, where the majority does the influencing. So conformity is sometimes referred to as majority influence, okay? So I'm linking those two phrases together. Conformity literally just means majority influence, but we're looking at minority influence today. Minority influence leads to internalization. Both public behavior and private beliefs are changed. And there are three processes to minority influence, consistency, commitment, and flexibility. So if you're the minority and you want to influence the majority to believe what you believe, you need to be consistent, you need to be committed, and you need to be flexible. Let's have a look at those now. Consistency, always doing the same thing. Consistency means the majority, sorry, consistency means the minority's view gains more interest. Consistency makes others rethink their own views. Maybe they've got a point if they all think this way and they have kept saying it. So if you imagine the teachers that were striking outside of the school who wanted more pay, if they were stood at the school and they kept saying, we want more pay, we want more pay, and they said it a long time and they were consistent with their message, they're more likely to be agreed with. If they were like, yeah, we, we want more money, but the next day they were like, yeah, I think we're all right where we are, people would be like, we don't believe what they're saying. We, we're not going to, we're not going to change our opinion to what they think. Now, there's synchronic consistency, people in the minority are all saying the same thing, and there's diachronic consistency, they've been saying the same thing for some time. So you are more likely to influence the majority as a minority if the minority altogether are saying the same thing, and they're saying it over a long period of time. So you must be consistent with your message. Commitment, showing deep involvement. Commitment helps gain attention, for example, through extreme activities. Activities must create some risk to the, for, to the minority to demonstrate commitment to the cause. So if all the teachers were outside on strike and it was raining and they were still committed to it and they were like, yeah, we're going to stay out here as long as it takes, you go, wow, they really believe what they believe in. Maybe, maybe I should think about what they're saying. The augmentation principle is when the majority pay even more attention because of the risk the minority are willing to take. Wow, he must really believe in what he's saying, so perhaps I ought to consider his view. And then finally, flexibility, showing willingness to listen to others. The minority should balance consistency and flexibility so they don't appear rigid. Nemeth argued that people being consistent and repeating the same argument and behavior is seen as rigid and off-putting to the majority. Instead, the minority should adapt their viewpoint and accept reasonable counter-arguments. So, for example, teachers would be like, 
we want a 12% increase. And the government will go, well, we'll give you 4%. We'll go, well, well let's, can, let's accept 6.5%. I'm not happy about that, but there we go. It shows flexibility. The process of minority influence has a snowball effect. The snowball effect is when over time more and more people become converted like a snowball gathering more snow as it rolls along. There is a switch from the minority to the majority. The more this happens, the faster the rate of conversion. Gradually, the minority view becomes the majority and therefore social change has occurred. That's minority influence. Can you get the definition down, please? Minority influence is a form of social influence in which a minority of people, sometimes just one person, persuades others to adopt their beliefs, behaviours or attitudes. This leads to internalisation or conversion in which private attitudes are changed as well as public behaviours. That is minority influence influence. It can start with one person or one group of people and they are trying to convince the majority. Let's, let's do an application question regarding recycling. There was a time when very few people recycled. People who did were viewed by the majority as a bit strange, right? Growing up, if you were like, oh, I'm going to recycle this, they'd be like, oh, he's a hippie. What sort of hippie are you? Recycling? What a loser, right? But now if you don't recycle, you go, that's not really acceptable. There's no reason why not to. How did the minority activity of recycling become so widely accepted by the majority? Include all of the features of minority influence in your answer. Can you remember all three? Give it a go. How do you think? There is no one specific right answer to this question, but how do you think the minority, those people that recycled, managed to convince the majority that this is the right thing to do using those three concepts of minority influence? First of all, environmentalists were consistent in their message that recycling was necessary in order to save energy and protect the planet. If they were like sometimes saying it, sometimes nice, fine, people wouldn't have gone along with it. You need to be consistent. People who are keen on recycling would make sacrifices because recycling can be time consuming and require more effort than not, than not doing it. Commitment, right? You see people, they're committed to doing these things and they're outside in the rain, putting their plastics and cardboards in different boxes, go bloody hell, that person must really care about recycling. Maybe they got a point. At first, environmentalists were calling for extreme changes, asking for everyone to give up all plastic and not uh, and not to use petrol cars. However, they were flexible with their views and realised not all people can be expected to make these changes so soon. So they were flexible, consistent, committed and flexible. Eventually, so many of the majority were converted that a minority activity became mainstream, following the snowball effect. And we've used all four key terms in our answer. And that is minority influence. Can you identify one thing you've learned about minority influence? Why do you think learning about minority influence is important? What was the hardest part to understand about minority influence? And what questions has this raised for you? If you have any questions, write them in the comments. Maybe I'll answer them. Maybe someone else can. And that is minority influence. We're going to uh, move on and have a look at Moscovici et al's research. Moscovici. I think he's actually um, Romanian. Anyway. Have a look at these colour blocks on the right. How many would you say are blue? And how many would you say are green? They're clearly all green, right? They're all green. I'm saying, I think they're all green, but wouldn't you agree? You would agree, wouldn't you? I'd say like, yeah, like 90 like to 100% of them are green. Moscovici et al. demonstrated minority influence in a study where a group of six people was asked to view a set of 36 blue colored slides that varied in intensity and then state whether the slides were blue or green. In each group there were two consistent uh, there were two confederates so fake participants who consistently said the slides were green. The true participants gave the same wrong answer green on 8.42% of the trials i.e. agreed with the confederates. The truth is all of the slides were blue. OK, but because the Confederates kept saying, oh, they're all green and they were consistent with their message. Eight percent of the time of the trials, uh, the participants agreed that they were green. 
a second group of participants was exposed to an inconsistent minority. So the Confederates said green 24 times and blue 12 times. In this case, agreement with the, uh, agreement with the answer green fell to only 1.25%. For a third control group, there were no Confederates, and all participants had to do was identify the colour of each slide. They got this wrong on 0.25% of the trials. So when there was no Confederates saying that those slides were green, 99.75% 90, of the time, people were like, yeah, they're blue, right? But when they had people, a minority, say they're green, they're green consistently, it was 8.42% of the time. When they were inconsistent with their message, they said they were green 1.25% of the time. Right, feel free to watch this video outlining Serge Moscovici et al's research in 1969. Can you think of any strengths and limitations? So if you go onto YouTube and type in Serge Moscovici and Minority Influence A-Level Psychology Revision, you can check that video out and it will give you a bit more details about what the research entailed. And that's Moscovici et al's 1969 research. Can you identify one thing you've learned about the research? Why do you think learning about this is important? And what was the hardest part to understand about Moscovici's research? What questions has this raised for you? If you have any questions, write them down. Let's look at discussing and evaluating minority influence. What are some of the strengths and limitations of minority influence? Research supporting consistency. Moscovici et al's uh, Moscovici Tower in 1969 found a consistent minority opinion had a greater effect on other people than an inconsistent opinion. Wood et al. conducted a meta-analysis of almost a hundred similar studies and found that minorities seen as being consistent were most influential. This confirms that consistency is a major factor in minority influence. Is this a strength or a limitation? It is a strength. It is supporting consistency. Moscovici's study, though, lacked mundane realism. Moscovici et al's study was, identify, uh, was identifying the colour of a slide, far removed from how minorities try to change majority opinion in the real world. How often are you sat there disagreeing about whether a colour is blue or green? Not very often, so it lacked mundane realism. In a jury decision, making the political campaigning outcomes are vastly more important, maybe a matter of life and death. Findings of studies lack external validity and are limited in what they tell us about how minority influence works in real world situations. So it doesn't tell us about real world scenarios. So it's a limitation because Moscovici's study about those colours lacked mundane realism. Finally, there is research support for flexibility. Nemeth and Brillmeyer in 1987 provided support for the role of flexibility in a simulated jury situation. A group discussed compensation to be paid to someone involved in an accident. A confederate who adopted an inflexible position had no effect on other group members. A confederate who compromised late in negotiations, showing flexibility, did exert an influence. But one who compromised earlier did not perceived as having caved in. This suggests that flexibility is effective at changing minority opinion, but only in certain circumstances. So this is a strength. This is research support for flexibility. Flexibility does convince more people to your opinion. Can you summarize each evaluated point into your own words? If you want to challenge yourself, can you summarize the evaluated points into exactly 10 words? Give that a go now, please. And that is the discussion and evaluation of minority influence completed. We've taken it off. We're done. And there we go. That's the end of the lesson. Uh, that was lesson nine, minority influence. Lesson 10 is the last lesson in this social influence unit, social influence and social change. Well done, my neo psychologist. Great job today. I've missed Neo. God bless and peace. Feeling like well, I feel like a prince, I'm feeling myself. I'm loaded with bills, cause I was blessed with no uncle Phil. Don't know how it feels. I wanted to flex, they told me to chill. I'm making a flip, my life is a flick, now load up the flip. Yeah.